This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on September 26, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we're coming to you from the incubator in New York City. You can tell because we have this virus-themed pattern behind us <laughs> in sound panels. And I have a special guest for you. Uh, he is from the University of Colorado, where is, he is a professor of pediatrics and infectious diseases, Kevin Messicar. Welcome to TWIV. Glad to be here. Thanks. You were actually supposed to be with me in Milan a couple of weeks ago, right? I, I was. I had some travel <laughs> delays and missed uh, yeah. the episode with Eva and Heli, but I'm glad you caught up with him. That was the European Society for Clinical Virology, yeah, right? Yeah, their annual meeting. Yeah. So uh, it turns out you're here in New York City. So um, that's the function of the incubator, to catch people when they're coming through and uh, speak with them like you pull yeah, them in for it's fun to hour. be here in person. Like I was saying, it's fun to give talks in person again like I did at NYU. It's, it's nice yeah. to be around people again. It's funny. I, you know, Peter Hotez was in town uh, last week. So I emailed him. I said, oh, maybe you could spend an hour at the incubator. And I get this stock email back. You know, I get a lot of emails, so you better email my assistant. <laughs> He's a busy guy. His availability is probably a lot less than my own. So Most people respond, though. That's the first time I've gotten something like that. Anyway, I want to talk about uh, your specialty, enteroviruses and acute flaccid myelitis, neurological diseases. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, know a bit about uh, your history. Where are you from? I, have, I detect a little bit of an accent there. A little Michigan accent. Oh, you're from Michigan? There. Yeah, so I grew up in <laughs> Michigan outside of Detroit, did my undergrad and med school at the University of Michigan in Ann mm. Arbor, uh, and then ventured out to Colorado to do my peds residency, stayed mm -hmm. and did my pediatric infectious disease fellowship, and then joined the faculty where I did a PhD in clinical investigation. So I do mostly clinical mm. research now, so I'm on, still on the clinical side, but designing studies, enrolling patients, collecting samples mm -hmm. and data is kind of where my niche has developed. So when you went to uh, University of Michigan as an undergrad, you were already thinking of medical school at that point? Yeah, I knew pretty early I mm -hmm. wanted to be in the sciences and mm -hmm. potentially in medicine. So my undergrad was in biochemistry, and I did some basic lab work. Uh, in a biochemistry lab. And then when I started medical school, I really wanted to kind of engage a little bit more uh, on the global health side. So I took some time off. I had initially thought I was going to be an oncologist, a pediatric oncologist. Mm -hmm. So I worked with St. Jude, who has a really cool um, uh, intern uh, education program where you go and are kind of exposed to the basic sciences and some of the clinical side. And when I was there, I saw a lecture of, of someone who was helping them set up their global health program. So mm -hmm. Decided to take a year off of school, worked half the year with them, half the year with a group in East Africa. Um, and there I was exposed to a lot more than just oncology. It was a lot of issues with infectious diseases. There was a 40% mm. HIV prevalence in the islands of Lake Victoria when I was there before antiretrovirals. And I was kind of hooked on the infectious disease part of medicine. So I would say even when I started into pediatrics, I knew I kind of wanted to go into infectious disease from there. And then training at the University of Colorado, there were just these giants in the field, Jim Todd, who discovered toxic shock syndrome, mm -hmm. Mimi Glodet, who was a researcher uh, in Hib and Kawasaki disease. So I had these mentors that I looked up to uh, and really wanted to kind of get in their niche someday. And so I followed in their path. Well, why pediatrics? I think very early on in medicine, most people will tell you they get a general <laughs> gut if they want to be on the kid side or yeah. on the adult side. And I've always just enjoyed being around kids. They're resilient. They're fun to be around. Mm. A lot of people say the parents can be difficult, but I would say as a parent myself, uh, you can feel for them what they're going through when they have a sick yeah. kid. But I mean, when I walk through a children's hospital, I have a completely different feeling of being at home <laughs> as mm -hmm. compared to when I get my own care in an adult hospital where I feel very foreign. So... I think in medicine, a lot of people eventually kind of find their way, and I could tell my way was going to be pediatrics. Are kids better with illness than adults, you think? 
I think just innately, when a kid feels better, they're ready to go. So yeah. you get them tuned up, you get them turned <laughs> around, and they're like out the door. We always laugh, like in the ICU, once you get a tube out of a kid off the ventilator, they are like ready to sprint down the hallway, and the ICU is ready to put mm -hmm. them back to the floor. Um, so it's really cool to see their resilience. And I think we'll get to the disease I study, um, which is acute flaccid myelitis, but to watch these kids who physically are not getting better in terms of like their strength isn't improving, but their resiliency and their function, they just learn ways to work around it. Just like you'd see in the polio area, they adapt to their deficit and they overcome it. Um, and it's not because of us, it's because of how amazing they are, yeah. which is really cool to see. So in Africa, you mentioned infectious diseases and cancers. I mean, what, you know, here in the U.S., it seems that cancers are really, in, at least in adults, are the main issue besides heart disease. But is that the case in Africa or infectious disease is more of a problem? Both together. Both together so yeah. really interesting program that St. Jude had where they were partnering with centers at the time in Central mm -hmm. America to bring some of the protocols to treat leukemia down there um, and replicate some of the success that they've mm -hmm. had in the U.S. And some initial things that were learned were when you start to treat those things in immune suppressed kids, you have issues with infectious disease, just like we do with our transplant patients and others. And so they really had to bring up the level of care for infection control, the facilities that were providing the care mm. to match what we do in the U.S. if you were going to treat kids with cancer down there. And in addition to that, there had to be a lot of social support. So like we have, you know, the Ronald McDonald houses and social supports to get people through the years of treatment. What they found down there is you had to build those programs as well. There was a huge issue with abandonment of treatment. They get induction, their kid would look better. They'd go back to their village and never come back until they relapsed. So St. Jude did a really cool program where they built kind of full comprehensive care when they delivered uh, pediatric cancer care. I think the places I was in Africa were, were a little too uh, primitive as far as not having the resources mm. to quite get to that level of care. That was more deworming vaccination programs and then delivery of HIV meds and care um, that was starting. And that was about a little under 20 years ago. So if you don't have a good health care structure, then you don't get you don't pick up cancers until it's very late. Right? Yeah. So late diagnosis was one issue and then abandonment <laughs> was the other big issue. And both were uh, leading to kids treating uh, or presenting very late to treatment where the drugs were no longer going to yeah. be as effective. Maybe a good idea for many, for most medical students to spend some time in Africa, right, and learn something different. Yeah, I think you have to do it in a in a sustainable way where you work through the local infrastructure. You're working to build yeah. um, technology, talent there. Um, I think the helicoptering in is probably not the right approach for our medical students and residents to do, but there are some really good sustainable programs like the St. Jude program that partners and trains mm. with local docs and you go and work with them and help build programs. I think that's the, the way to go in terms of global health. Yeah, I, I, that's the way we're looking now with infectious diseases. We don't, we used to go and grab samples and take them home, but now we're building local laboratories. It's, it's so important to partner if you're doing any research in the global health setting so that we're building resources there, we're sharing samples and data, we're sharing authorship. I think yeah. resource building is really the, the way to go in the uh, global health realm. You need to utilize the people who are there. They're capable. You just have to teach them, right? Yep. And then you have a, a nice... Uh, workforce that can get things done. Yeah, it's a, it can be a great partnership if it's done in the right way. All right, so let's talk about uh, the things you work on. So as you know, I worked on polio my most of my career. And in 2014, we got interested in enterovirus D68 because, as you know, uh, there was an outbreak in, in your state, right? So why don't you give us a little history of that? What were you doing at the time and what, what happened in 2014? Yeah, so it's a, it was a really interesting story. So I was a pediatric infectious disease fellow. I was interested in central nervous system infections. I was mm -hmm. working with some CDC's mentors in the arboviral disease branch. And I had a study up and running that I was enrolling kids that we suspected had a central nervous system infection. So kids who got a spinal tap mm. and had cells in it, we would collect spinal fluid from them. Interestingly, during my fellowship, I saw a little report come out from AAN, the neurology meeting mm -hmm. in 2012, that some colleagues, Keith Van Heron and Carol Glazer in California, had noticed a little cluster of kids with polio-like disease. Mm -hmm. And they had put out a report that I think in two of six, they had found a not common virus at the time, enterovirus D68. And 
No one really knew exactly what was going on there, but it was important that they mm. reported it because we heard about it. Then in 2014, I had just come out of fellowship. I actually did hospital medicine too, meaning I took care of general kids up on the pediatric floors and they kind of start you out when things are slow and I was ready to kind of mm. get my wheels going and, and get used to being up on the wards when all of a sudden it was busy as get out. And it was during a season when we shouldn't be busy. RSV is not there yet. Flu's not there yet. And we were packed in our ERs and our floors and our ICUs were all these wheezing kids in a season that we usually don't see that much respiratory disease. And then there were some colleagues uh, at Kansas City and Chicago who had shared some samples with the CDC noting the same thing. And when they sequenced the rhinoenteropositives, they happened to be this same virus, enterovirus D68. We sequenced some of ours and, and likewise knew mm -hmm. we were in the midst of an enterovirus D68 outbreak. Um, and when I talked to Carol Glazer, um, the woman who ran the California Encephalitis Project, excellent clinician, epidemiologist, she said, when I saw you guys had an EV68 outbreak, I was just waiting for it. I was waiting to hear, are we going to see more of these polio-like cases? And slowly, we started to get a trickle of kids that were coming into my study. So I was going to the bedside to enroll them into a research study to collect samples and data to improve our diagnostics for CNS infections. But these weren't like the kids I had been enrolling for the past five years. These weren't kids with meningitis. These weren't kids who were seizing or confused with encephalitis. They were sitting there unable to move an arm or a leg. And when we went down with our neuroradiologist and looked at their MRI scans, they were pulling out old textbooks and looking up pictures, the very few there were, of polio and it would look, mm. what it looked like on MRI. And they basically said this looks identical to what polio and in some cases of West Nile look like in the spinal cord. Um, so I would say right away we had a clinical hunch or suspicion based on the work done in California, based on the clinical pattern, that the two were related. So we called our state health department. Our state health department helped us reach out to CDC. CDC sent an uh, EIS team, the Emergency in or Epidemic Intelligence Service. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those people who came out happened to be a neuroepidemiologist, so a neurologist um, that was working to train in epidemiology. And I remember him walking out of our neuroradiology darkroom after looking at the first group of images and saying, you guys are seeing polio. This is just not due to polio. So it was at that time that things mm -hmm. es escalated and we started to raise concerns that other people throughout the country should be looking for it. Um, and indeed, other places started to report it after that time. But we were fortunate, and it speaks to kind of preparedness in terms of clinical research, that we had a study open. We were consenting these patients. We were collecting samples. We were collecting data. So we had one of the only kind of consented sample sets to investigate the cause of this. So I would say chance favors the prepared mind in that respect. And as far as like research funding and clinical research goes, it's really important that we have these type of cohort studies out there to capture things as they emerge. So what's the difference between poliomyelitis, acute flaccid myelitis, which you've mentioned, and acute flaccid paralysis? And it's such a good question <clears throat> and it comes up all the time. So <clears throat> you know very well the origin of the term poliomyelitis comes from, from the Greek polios meaning gray, mile meaning marrow, referring to the spinal cord, and itis mm -hmm. being inflammation. So it literally means inflammation of the gray matter of the spinal cord. It was actually a pathologic definition mm -hmm. before they discovered poliovirus. So it was what they were seeing on autopsy in the fatal cases that they described as poliomyelitis. Then they discovered the virus, named it after the pathologic syndrome. Um, that caused challenges when they recognized that other viruses besides poliovirus could lead to the same syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you can read some papers when West Nile emerged in the U.S. and was causing very similar cases like, what do we call this? Do we call this West Nile poliomyelitis? Mm -hmm. That's kind of confusing. Do we call it West Nile acute flaccid paralysis? Um, and so that was already in the literature as like this terminology quandary because you have this term that's kind of tied to this virus, but other viruses can cause it. Just a quick sidestep, the term acute flaccid paralysis simply means the acute onset of flaccid weakness in a limb. That's meant to be a really sensitive case definition by the polio eradication campaign to catch cases. We know a lot of things can lead to that, but mm -hmm. under that umbrella, we should ca catch cases of polio if we're testing appropriately. So that's kind of a big overarching term. Poliomyelitis would be under that. And interestingly, when we, when we started to see our outbreak, there were mm -hmm. already people well-versed in this field 
that knew this was going to be an issue with terminology. And one of them was Ben Greenberg, uh, a neurologist in Texas. And I remember jumping on a phone call after the initial reports went out and we were going to kind of come up with a plan of how to respond to this. And we spent the first hour and a half of this phone call with like 50 people on it debating the term to use. And I, at the time, was like, why are we all wasting our time? We need to be, you know, acting and, and doing things. <laughs> and now looking back, I see just how important it was to kind of rename things and recategorize things to kind of separate from the term that was linked to polio virus and to also update it to bring us into the era of the MRI, where we don't have to go to autopsy to see what's going on in the spinal okay, cord. Okay. So the term acute flaccid myelitis now is basically the clinical cr criteria of acute flaccid paralysis, but you need imaging findings of a gray matter lesion in the spinal cord, which is basically what they saw in autopsy with poliomyelitis, okay. but we're seeing it on MRI. So yeah. that was the term AFM. So AFM about. arose after the 2014 outbreak. Yes, during basically. the initial, initial outbreak, and it was really due to the input of an astute group of neurologists who said we need a more okay. all-encompassing term that's not linked to a particular pathogen. And so AFM is AFP with, a, with an MRI diagnosis on Correct. top. So you need to have paralysis, right? Correct. Correct. Um, you need to have paralysis of a limb. There are some issues with it, right? An epi mm. case definition is meant to be black and white. So we have something to count. In the clinical world, <laughs> we live in the gray and there are some cases that fit and don't fit. And one mm. good example of this, and you'll know very well of bulbar polio back in the day. So mm -hmm. not everyone with polio had a weak arm or a weak leg. They could have a facial droop. They could have eye palsies, difficulty swallowing, because it hits the cranial nerve motor nuclei, the same type mm. of neur neuron that would be in the spinal cord. It's got a tropism for those type of, of neurons. So you can have cranial nerve only polio. We've seen the same with EV68. It can cause cranial nerve only presentations that have no limb involvement, that don't have anything in the spinal cord, but have knocked off these areas in the brainstem. Those aren't counted by CDC because they don't meet case definition for AFM, but thinking like a hmm. infectious disease doc or a virologist, those to me lump into the same disease yeah. process there. Yeah. And it's the equivalent of bulbar polio, really. So are the the types of paralysis you see with 68 the same as with polio, or are there some differences? There are some differences. So mm -hmm. in general, yes, it seems to be the same type of process. It seems to like the same type of neuron. Interestingly, compared to polio and EV71, which tend to affect the legs more than the arms, EV68 AFM tends to affect the arms more than the legs. Mm -hmm. Both are asymmetric, so tend to affect one side more than the other. Both are lower motor neuron deficits, meaning they're flaccid, so hypotonic, hyporeflexic, kind of like a noodle, not stiff, or upper motor neuron. Uh, so same disease process, but there are some kind of subtle differences in how they present. And there's a lot of hypotheses and things of like, could it be because EV68 is transmitted by respiratory routes and gets into the higher areas of the spinal cord if there's direct retrograde exonal transport mm. compared to polio, EV71, which replicate kind of lower down and could could go to lower areas of the cord. I don't think we have hard data on any of that, but there is some speculation mm -hmm. of why do we see different okay. clinical phenotypes there. So there are other enteroviruses that cause AFM, obviously, EV68, polio, 71, many others, right? Yep. What else can cause AFM? Are there non-infectious causes? So yes, there are mimickers that mm -hmm. would meet case definition. If you actually confirmed a diagnosis, the CDC would exclude them because they have an alternate etiology. But there are some antibody-associated conditions, okay. one called MOG or myelin oligodendrocyte oligodendrocyte glycoprotein disorder. Mm -hmm. It's an antibody against gangliosides that can cause a pattern very similar. We actually wrote a paper on how uh, MOG patients can look just like AFM patients in terms of the mm -hmm. spinal cord findings. Um, NMO or neuromyelitis optica, which is due to anti-aquaporin antibodies, can also look similarly in the spinal cord, although can cause optic nerve defects as well. Mm -hmm. So there's always overlap. Whenever we create a clinical syndrome, that's what we see. There's multiple pathways to get there, which is why the etiologic investigation was so interesting. I mean, it took us the last 10 years to really prove that EV68 was the predominant pathogen behind these every other year waves. And you may say why that was your suspicion all along, but really to button up the epidemiologic case involved a whole lot of steps along the way. And I think many people would say it wasn't until your colleague Ian Lipkin's work and Michael Wilson's work finding antibodies in the spinal fluid to enteroviruses and then Matt mm -hmm. Voigt's uh, recent 
paper in the New England Journal from an autopsy case where they stained virus in motor neurons from a fatal human case. It wasn't until those kind of pieces came together that things were kind of more definitively proven. So what's the course of the disease? It's, it's initiated by a respiratory infection. What's the timing? Yeah, so we've learned the natural history really well, and this was an, another important lesson. It was really important to start a clinic to take really good mm -hmm. care of these kids, but also to learn as much as we could about the disease process. And when we put the data together, around 90% of them would have a febrile prodrome, so a febrile illness. Most of them had respiratory symptoms, so runny nose, cough, sore throat, mm -hmm. difficulty breathing. Few were actually sick enough to be hospitalized. Most just had cold symptoms. We had a couple kids with like asthma attacks that had to go in the hospital. But most of them were getting better over the course of a week from the respiratory component of the disease. And then around a week later, those who went on to neurologic uh, disease would have the onset of neurologic symptoms. They'd complain of stiffness or pain in the neck, mm. headaches. They'd have recrudescence of their fever. And then interestingly, the older kids would tell you they could actually feel pain or tingling in the limb that ultimately would go on mm. to become paralyzed. And the real hallmark of the disease was a very rapid onset of flaccid limb weakness. So we had kids who went to bed at night, normal, woke up in the morning and couldn't raise an arm. So it happened really, really quickly. Um, and like I said before, lower motor neurons, so noodle-like flaccid, hypotonic, they lose their reflexes. Um, it looks a lot like polio in the acute mm -hmm. phase. And then we started a clinic to follow them over the past now almost 10 years. And so we've had a group of kids that we've done routine assessments with and what we find is about three quarters of them continue to have residual weakness, paralysis, and, and deficit. So it looks a lot like polio. And unfortunately, that comes with a lot of the complications we saw during polio where those muscles that aren't getting nerve signals mm. actually atrophy. So you'll see the one arm compared to the other arm be very thin. Um, we see the spine actually developing scoliosis because the muscles on each side are pulling asymmetrically, and that's well described in polio. We see bone density go down. So we've learned a lot mm. by following these kids over time. And I think the most heartbreaking part is in the muscles that don't get uh, innervation, they really lose muscle and continue to have disability. That being said, we are in the modern era of like incredible medicine and science, and there are some really innovative things happening. First and foremost, I wouldn't discount just routine rehabilitation care. Mm -hmm. The rehab doctors, PT, OT, speech therapists that work with these kids to strengthen their remaining muscles is probably the most effective therapy. But there also are some surgeons who are doing really cool things. They're taking functioning nerves like intercostal nerves and splitting off. It's kind of like an electrician splitting off mm. uh, a portion of a func functioning nerve and plugging them into mm. denervated muscle groups and getting some return of function, not full function by any means, but starting to try to maximize functional outcomes in these kids, things that we couldn't do back in the polio era. So uh, this, the time course sounds very much like polio. There's a seven-ish to 10-day minor illness, yep. febrile, nonspecific syndromes, and then a fraction of the patients go on to get CNS. And in, for polio, it's one in 100, one in a few hundred, depending on the serotype. What's the fraction for EVD68? We, we have no idea. So I would be lying <laughs> if I told you. I can tell you my guess. So it's really interesting to, to read this. And I think it gets at this question of why some years do you see more AFM with EV68, why some less, why with you know some strains of poliovirus do you see more commonly the paralytic outcome versus others. Mm. From what I read, I get the same numbers that you do for polio, EV71 marches up to like one in 10,000 or so, and then EVD70, the other one in the tropics that causes hemorrhagic conjunctivitis and that probably one in 50,000 or so. Mm. Um, we don't have numbers for EV68 because we don't have the denominator. Yeah. So we don't have yeah, a yeah. clinical test for it. I would guess, based on the burden of disease we see, it's like one in the 100,000 type range. We see a whole lot of respiratory disease. And you know very well the seroprevalence data, which has its issues with you know, cross-reactivity and such. But it would suggest a vast majority of people have some type of immunity to EV68. Whether that means exposure or not is a different question. Mm. But there's probably a lot more EV68 out there than we realize. And I think that part of things often gets misconstrued. People say, oh my God, EV68, it's this horrible rare virus that this kid got that got paralyzed. The way I think of it is it's this really common virus that most people get 
and very few people get the rare neurologic complication of AFM. And we're trying to understand that part of things better. Why do those kids mm -hmm. go on to that presentation? EB68 was originally isolated in California, right, in the 60s. Yep, Scheibel, We yep. didn't see any AFM until 2012, I guess, yep. and then 2014. Why is that? I know... So we there's a think. lot of controversy <laughs> in this area. It could just be a numbers game. There wasn't mm -hmm. enough out there to connect the dots of mm -hmm. the rare cases. I have a theory about these cases of Hopkins syndrome that you'll read about in the literature, which was like a wheezing. It was always described clinically as like a wheezing asthma-like illness followed by paralysis. We didn't have testing back then. You know, EV68 is tough to culture. Mm. It takes different conditions and cooler yeah. temperatures and acidic environment or non-acidic environment. Um, I suspect that those could be a respiratory enterovirus, whether EV68 or other, that we hadn't put the pieces together yet. There was kind of early work, as you saw, uh, in vitro where people had difficulty culturing uh, EV68 in some neuronal cell lines, but others, and Amy and others, have been able to do so. Um, so I don't think we know the answer to kind of what changed from when it started in the 1960s to why we're seeing more AFM now. I will say I do think we're seeing just more disease due to it in general. So it may just be a numbers game. Reminds me of polio, which before 1900 was just a, a case here and there, sporadic, and then suddenly the epidemiology changed and became epidemic. Yep. And that's because we uh, we had we improved sanitation and delayed infection. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm thinking there must be a similar reason for 68 that we just don't know about. Right? Yeah, enteroviruses are really interesting. I, there's a lot that we can't explain. Enterovirus 71, we have it in the US, we have it in Europe, but why doesn't it do there what it does in the Asian Pacific area where every few years it causes massive outbreaks, millions mm -hmm. of people with hand foot mouth mm -hmm. disease, brainstem encephalitis cases, AFM cases, but it hung on and kind of took foothold for endemicity there, but just kind of causes sporadic stuff elsewhere. Really interesting. I and wish, that's why they had better. Pardon? That's why they have a vaccine for, yeah. for age because there's so many cases of 71, right? Yeah. And to, to real quick connect those two pieces, mm. the first point you make, I think, is a really good one. We know since polio, but now with EV71 for sure, enteroviruses are vaccine preventable diseases. Sure, we can sure. create effective vaccines against them. And this, to se connect the second point, and this was a question you asked me at ESCV mm. why, why go after vaccines for EV68? And to me, it's not because we're going to deploy them right away. Mm. It's because as far as preparedness, when we talk about preparedness, it's being prepared for we don't know which direction it's going to head. We were pleasantly surprised in 2022. We saw a lot of EV68 respiratory disease and not a lot of AFM for the first time. It kind of decoupled. We don't know exactly why that is. But what if that goes the other way? What if we see a massive outbreak and it's more likely to cause AFM to create vaccines ahead of time and have on-the-shelf tools, not that you're going to use them right now, but ready to deploy if something turned the wrong way like polio in the 50s, sure, sure. I think is the wise part of, of preparedness. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's what you told me in Milan. You said we should be ready. And I, I have no problem with that. But at the current levels, right, one in 100,000, it's not really a vaccine preventable illness, right? Correct, except going back to our conversation of not understanding the denominator, I actually think EV68 respiratory disease alone mm. has a big burden of disease, probably behind flu and RSV, maybe around human metanumovirus levels. But I think once we start to get more widespread testing, and I do suspect that some commercial manufacturers will start to put a target on some of the kind of multiplex respiratory panel mm. testing, mm -hmm. We're going to recognize that every other year, this packs our children's hospitals, like with burden of disease that we nearly ran out of asthma medications. We, we're seeing so many kids. We have trouble, you know, mm -hmm. staffing mm -hmm. up for it. So if you're starting to see that level of strain on the system and you have a vaccine to prevent it, that may be the instigation right there, even without the neurologic disease. So I do think we need better data on burden of disease. So right now we don't test for 68, is that? You the... can, right? We have a PCR set of primers that we use behind yeah. the scenes, but commercially most platforms can give you the enterovirus, rhinovirus combined target. As you know, they're right. really closely genetically related. Yep. So it can't tell you uh, which of those That's it right. is. Um, but in those places that are interested in, CDC obviously does VP1 sequencing that mm -hmm, can type mm -hmm. all of the enteroviruses. We're starting to get an idea 
of patterns of circulation and, and burden of disease, but we have more work to do in that realm. Yeah, I remember. So the BioFire panel will just tell you enterorhino, and it will tell you 68 unless you do sequencing, right? Yes, we did a really cool project with them, which I'll tell you about. We, we've lost the signal, but they use a set of primers that's proprietary mm -hmm. to, to hit that overall enterorhino target. And we actually took a, a, a subset of samples that we knew were EV68 positive versus other rhino and enteros, and they applied machine learning to look at the melt curves of the yeah. primer sets. And with about 90% sensitivity and specificity, they could call which samples were EV68 or not. And it was enough that we could look at kind of patterns of it spreading across the country, and we used it for an early warning system in 2018 when we saw uh, it come back. Unfortunately, because it's a multiplex PCR panel, when they added the SARS-CoV-2 target for RPP 2.1 or whatever it was, they lost that signal. So we, we can't see. track that anymore. Okay. But it just taught me how amazing it would be to have better diagnostics to know when this virus is showing up. Because for me as a clinician too, this, this virus does something different than our typical lower respiratory tract viruses. I mean, kids with influenza, kids with RSV, they have mucus, they have infiltrates on their x-ray, they stay sick for a while with lower respiratory tract findings. Kids with EV68, whether or not they have a history of asthma, come in with clamped down airways. They look like asthmatics. They're wheezing. They respond to asthma medications. So they respond to bronchodilators like albuterol, steroids. And even though they come in really sick, they have a high chance of going to the ICU they turn around really quickly and they do really well from the respiratory disease standpoint. And that to me tells me that there's something else going on in the lung. It's not looking like a severe viral infection of the lower respiratory mm -hmm. tract. It's mm -hmm. looking like a trigger for constriction of the airways. And there is some data that there's uh, an IL-17 response to the virus in lower respiratory tract, and that's known as a trigger for bronchoreactivity. So I would suspect that it's following a different pathophysiology, kind of similar to the rhinoviruses like Rhino C that causes asthma mm -hmm. exacerbations. I do think it's doing something different. And from a clinical standpoint, we manage these patients a little different. We don't typically treat a kid with RSV with, even if they're wheezing with bronchodilator, bronchodilators and steroids, whereas I do think these EV68 kids respond. So in what fraction of kids who are infected does the virus go down into the lung? Do we know? God, we, all of these questions I wish we had <laughs> answers to. But so from my clinical research mindset, in order to do that study, you would have to do more sampling in the community. Yeah. Really what we're catching right now is kids who are sick enough to come into the okay. hospital. Um, mm -hmm. There have been mm -hmm. a few studies in Japan and, show, and, and other places that have looked out in the community. We are actually doing some some household contact studies where we take the kid who comes in the hospital because we can identify them, but enroll their family members to mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. when they're exposed to the same mm -hmm. virus in the household, what do the more mild presentations look like? Why does that one kid get that sick? The parent maybe only gets a cold and the sibling doesn't get hospitalized. We're trying to look into like, why does one virus that most of us get end up in so many different endpoints? Does, does the virus ever make adults seriously ill? Again, we don't have that data. There are some papers out of Europe that that adults can get respiratory illness from it. I would say burden of disease-wise, our adult colleagues do not see the waves of people coming in during an EVD-68 wave. The preliminary data from our household contact study was that a good number of adults in the household of the kid who was hospitalized got infected and were symptomatic, but none were sick enough to be hospitalized. So mm. it may be that we have built up some immunity over time, just like with COVID. Each time you get it, it's a little less severe. You may still feel some symptoms, but not sick enough to go into the hospital. And that may also be why we don't see AFM in adults. Um, really, the, the mm -hmm. cases that we've seen AFM due to EV68 or 71 in adults have been folks on drugs that have suppressed the humoral branch of their immune system. Yeah. So uh, rituximab type drugs that wipe out um, B cell responses, um, leading them to have a severe outcome that mm -hmm. others wouldn't. So is the transmission respiratory droplet, contact, or both? Do we know? We presume it's respiratory droplet because mm. it's a respiratory virus that causes respiratory <laughs> symptoms. It grows at a cold, colder temperature, which would be the temperature in the back of the nose. Amy challenged me on this the last time <laughs> I spoke to her and said, you know, rhinoviruses, when they 
I, w- I was telling her, I, they could do a lot of things that we can't do in the current era, nor would anyone want to do with EV68, but all the transmission studies, you know, mm-hmm. where they put people in a room and gave one rhinovirus and saw how it spread around, she was saying was a lot more contact than people, yeah, right. like fomite transmission than people recognize. Um, and we don't know what aspect of that uh involves EV68, but we do know it's a coughing, respiratory illness. We do know it's most likely uh, or most frequently detected from the nasopharynx. So it's probably in our respiratory droplets. We know that we don't find it very often in stool. um, And we think that's because of its acid lability. Unlike EV71 and polio, we can't uh, catch it there as frequently. Interestingly, is a bit of a side note, but we do detect it in wastewater. So we did some projects mm-hmm. with our state health department this year, and we went from the SARS-CoV-2 sampling of the wastewater basins and said, could we find EV68 correlating mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. our outbreak? And we could actually take the zip codes of the patients in our hospital with EV68 and track quantitatively the signal in the wastewater and had a beautiful, beautiful epi curve that matched exactly the spread of EV68 through our community. Now, Heli, who you had on ESCV, mm. challenged me the last time I talked to her because I said, how do you think it gets there? Because we don't detect it in stool a lot in these patients. Is there just not enough, you know, on a patient by patient level, but enough yeah. in the wastewater yeah. altogether? And she said, what about urine? I said, I don't know why I never thought of that, but we're going to start collecting urine in some kids and see if it's being shed in the urine at all, um, if that mm. could be a potential way that we're detecting it in wastewater. But we are not the first people. There's a group in Israel, the group in Italy, the California group. Everyone who's kind of branched into wastewater for EV68 is finding the same thing. It, it really is easy to yeah. track. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it were in stool because, as you know, the mucus we swallow, right? Yep. And it goes through. And that's why you can track most respiratory viruses, even if they're not reproducing in the gut. But um, so I'm not sure why you wouldn't pick it up from stool. Yeah. But uh, urine, I guess, there's not really a viremic phase, but there might be some random particles. Nothing is 100%, right, in yeah. biology. So there could be some particles. And the kidneys are concentrating it, so maybe. And it's crazy how but, sensitive the, the wastewater um, yeah, technologies yeah. are nowadays. And obviously, it's like pooled specimens galore. <laughs> You're sure, getting samples sure, sure. From, no, but for many well, viruses, it's correlating really well with uh, outbreaks. So yeah. it's a great... I mean, as as Laurie Garrett told me once, it's been around for ages, but really came into its own during COVID. And now everybody And it started with polio, too. So this is kind of coming full circle to apply it back to enteroviruses again. But yeah. So the the reason I asked about contact versus droplets, because, you know, we thought for COVID it might be contact. And it looks like it's not very much. It's Mm -hmm. mostly droplet. Rhinoviruses seem to have a major contact component. You can do challenge experiments where people play cards and that's how they transmit it. And during COVID, the biofire, if you looked at the data, the rhinos kept circulating, even with masking and everything. So maybe there are other ways, maybe transmission by contact is is really big for that one. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so a couple of other things. One is, so it's, it's inhaled, it goes into your upper tract initially. And then in some kids, it goes down to the lungs. But um, how is it getting into the CNS? You mentioned some neuronal trafficking. You think that there, there are innervations in the upper tract, right? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think we know. Um, I think what we do know, at least in a microfluidic chamber model, uh, mm-hmm. Ken Tyler's work would suggest if you put virus on the axonal end, It'll you travel, can stain yeah. it on the cell body end. So there's the potential for retrograde axonal transport. Most of the animal models are too small to look mm-hmm. at olfactory nerve. I've asked that question a million times. You read the historic polio books, and that was suspected, though proven not to be true. Yeah, um, yeah. So we don't really know how it gets back there yet. Um, I think that kind of remains an unanswered question. Do, do you need lower lung involvement to get AFM? S- Symptomatically, I would say we have a lot of kids who either don't even have a respiratory prodrome or just have mild upper respiratory symptoms. That doesn't mean that there's not something going on down in their lungs. I don't think anyone's sampled that. Again, you you would need a crystal ball to do those studies. You'd Hmm. need to know which of the 100,000 kids with EV68 is going to go on to AFM. So it's a very difficult question to answer unless you're doing an animal challenge model. And, And the larger animal models haven't panned out too well for EV68 so far. Most of them are, you know, neonatal mouse, interferon knockout mouse, cotton rat, ferret type models. Yeah, there's also a big non-human primate study Mm -hmm. where none of them 
to- okay. were infected. Yeah. So uh, that's a big problem, not having a model. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is, is 68 predominantly U.S. or is it global? It's, it's definitely global. And yeah. it's a great example of you, you find what you're looking for when you look. Um, the European group that you were just with, that ESCV mm. is wonderful, that NPEN, the European Non-Polio Enterovirus Network, um, Burton Easters and his colleagues in Netherlands mm. really started early on looking. And once they started looking, they were finding the same patterns. Interestingly, Europe had been on a even year cycle with us, 2014, 16, 18. And then the difference in when pandemic precautions were lifted may have had something to do with it, but they actually had an outbreak in 2021 and are seeing circulation again this year in 2023. So they're almost off cycle with mm-hmm. us now. We had 2014, 16, 18, and we really didn't see resurgence until 2022 uh, this year. So we haven't seen a lot of circulation this year. Fortunately, we think that's due to kind of the widespread outbreak we saw last year, lots of immunity, mm-hmm. and we're hoping that we get spared this year. And thus far, that seems to be the case. So do, are there serotypes of 68? I know Amy's is the one to ask about this, but I thought I would ask you because you see a lot of kids with it. Yeah. So the, the phylogenetics is also controversial. I think mm. talk to Steve Oberstee about this. He's got a great perspective, having been in the enterovirus space for a long time. You know, when you call something a B1 versus a B3 is a bit arbitrary. That, that next strain website, if you've been mm-hmm. on there, is really, really cool. And I think it's at kind of the continuously changing nature of yep. these viruses. They're constantly evolving. You can see kind of one branching off the next, branching off the next. As humans, when we chop one thing and call it a, mm. a B1, B2, B3 is a little uh, on our side of things. But we certainly have seen the virus change over time. Um, our uh, most recent outbreaks in 2018 and 2022 in the U.S. have all been clade B3. Um, but beyond that, I think um, we know the Furman strain, the Rin strain, kind of the initial strains. Um, but I would say Amy might be better to ask that question of when you kind of define a separate uh, yeah. serotype. But I know that some of the data she generated before leaving my lab suggested the existence of serotypes. Mm-hmm. You could immunize with various isolates and the antibodies would neutralize some but not others, but it needs more work. And it's important work too, because I think that the paper um, that Peter Krug and and Tracy Ruckwert and colleagues at VRC came out with that the virus-like particle vaccine Mm -hmm. work uh, really showed it was important what strain you designed your VLP vaccine off, whether you got cross protection or not. So I do think Amy's doing great work in that area. They're doing great work in that area. And there's a lot to be learned that has practical implications. So the, the, the incidence of, paral- of AFM in kids who, who are infected is rare. Do you think it might be a, a SNP that's controlling susceptibility to paralysis? Again, I have my hunches and hypotheses. <laughs> I have no data. I think that entire realm of neuroinfectious disease is mm. a black box that we're starting to uncover. There's a reason why we have really common viruses, but certain people develop the severe yeah. neuroinvasive yeah. outcome. I think RAN-BP2 is a great example of acute necrotizing encephalopathy, a genetic mutation where people see influenza and get horrible, severe disease that's familial as the gene is passed mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've known for other enteroviruses that humoral immunity is really important. Our A-gamma globulinemic kids or hypogamma globulinemic kids that can't mount a normal antibody response are more apt to get chronic encephalitis or recurrent encephalitis. I don't know if you saw the paper that just came out, fascinating work on West Nile encephalitis, finding anti-interferon antibodies pre-existing in severe encephalitis cases. So I think that piece of the picture is clearly at play in some way or another with AFM, but we don't have the answer yet. And there are people working really hard on the host side of things because I don't think we've, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we've never been able to answer that for polio, right? We don't no. know why. I mean, I saw there's a group in uh, Aarhus in, in Denmark, right, who looked at people who had poliomyelitis and looked for, they did GWAS and looked for mm-hmm. SNPs. And they they didn't really find anything mm-hmm. specific. I think the sample is too small and there's a lot of noise in it, right? It's hard to do, but... For for other diseases, you can you can find it. for COVID since we have so many patients, you can find signals, right? Yeah. Uh, my feeling is that for a lot of these viruses, the, uh, 
any SNP that decreases, say, an innate response or some kind of, of immune response will allow higher replication. And that by itself is probably enough to get into the CNS. Mm -hmm. I think there's a certain level you need. And above that, it'll get in. Lower, Below yeah. that, it doesn't get in. Yeah. It's very simple. What I spent 40 years looking for neurovirulence determinants in polio. You know, something specific that's for the CNS, and it doesn't exist. Yep. It's, I think it's all about fitness now, Yep. right? Albert Sabin selected for polio va vaccines that were less fit. And that's why they don't make a, a strong of viremia and they don't get into the CNS. And when they revert, they become more fit. They, get, they, they multiply the higher levels in the blood and you get vaccine associated paralysis. That's what I've. So, would your suspicion then be f extrapolating to EV68 being around since the 1960s, but seeing more of the clinical presentation mm. of neurologic disease that we're just seeing a more fit virus that you're getting higher levels and more likely to go to the CNS? Well, I, I'm not sure if it's the virus or it has to do with population immunity. Yep. I suspect that somehow population immunity has changed and now they're, and suddenly in 2014, there were cohorts of kids who no longer were uh, protected. Mm -hmm. So I don't particularly think it's a virus because Amy, as you know, published a study showing that the virus from the 60s and the present are, are equally able to infect neuronal cultures. Mm -hmm. And I think Ken Tyler has, has done the same. So I think it's something to do with population as it was for polio, yeah. right? But what it is, I'm not sure. One of our ideas is that it has to do with the change of the polio vaccine in 2000 from OPV to IPV. And then 14 years later, suddenly you have a cohort of kids who don't have the right antibodies. And so I, I just don't know. I think we need to, I, I think we, people like to look at the genome sequence and say, this is the answer. Yeah. But I really want people to look beyond that because that was the answer for polio, right? It wasn't the genome sequence. Yep. We didn't have any genome sequence. And the then. genome's always going to change. It always changes. Virus, so you're, so you're going to see have, changes yeah. and, and you're going to say, ah, these must have to do with the phenotype, but not necessarily. Yep. So... I just want people to look beyond. And, you know, the problem is it's it's hard because it's easy to look at the genome sequence and say, ah, there's a change. But to look at epidemiological factors and population-based, as you know, is hard. Yeah, and we really don't hard. have much data for 68. So yeah. that's, that's what I think. Um, let's see. Uh, I've heard that it was hard to convince the CDC that EVD68 was the, the cause of AFM, right? Uh, Mark Blanche always used to say to me, Vincent, there's so many viruses in, the, in, in, in snot that we get from kids. How do we know which ones are causing AFM? Is that true? So my politically correct <laughs> answer is that they were being epidemiologically rigorous. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, no, but really, they have a long perspective of getting called with every outbreak of every new thing, which many times is people are looking now or yeah, yeah, biases sure. involved. And so... They have a strict set of epidemiologic criteria that, you know, you weigh trigger and outcome and see if there's a causal relationship. I will say that work took us 10 years to put the epi puzzle together, mm. to get some additional diagnostics out of the CSF, to get the animal models, the in vitro data, to really make a, a case, coax postulates, finding yeah. the virus in the spinal cord of that human case. Um, I think they approached it with a healthy level of skepticism up front. It's hard as a clinician because as a clinician, you know, they asked, how do you know you haven't seen this before? And I said, we've, you know, got 12 paralyzed kids in our hospital right now. By all means, we've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. But um, you've got to prove mm. that, you know, and you have to prove that by making a strict case definition, sure, by sure. going back and making sure your baseline rates haven't uh, been there and just flown under the radar. So. They've been amazing partners. The AFM team at CDC um, with Janelle Ruth and Sarah Kidd and their colleagues have really changed the entire field. They've brought in the family and parent communities. They've brought in the basic science communities and funded you know, studies and support on the public health side of things. There's this AFM working group that Amy attends mm -hmm. uh, run by Carlos Pardo, who's a child neurologist, that once a month, everyone gets on a, a phone call, researchers, clinicians, parents, CDC, European colleagues, and we all discuss what's going on on the research side. What are we seeing clinically? Um, we publish papers together in the Lancet on how to manage these kids and better diagnose things. It has really been like the joy of my career, the people I've gotten to work with on this, because it's not people trying to commercialize anything or like with ulterior motives. It's people trying to help families with kids that are paralyzed that have no answers. And 
when you have altruistic people working with the right intention in a collegial atmosphere, it is fun to do science. I never thought, going back to my initial story, mm -hmm. research was going to be a big part of my career. I thought I'd be a clinician. I love taking care of kids. And this really has motivated this aspect of my career that now is the majority of what I do, and I totally love it. And it's because of the people I get to work with and the families I get to work with and the kids I get to work with. So there are other um, viruses that cause neurologic infections. You, you're interested in some of those, and some of them have been causing uh, outbreaks lately. There was an outbreak of Echo 11 recently in Europe. Have you paid attention to that? Yeah, so we've been watching that really closely. Mm -hmm. And again, this speaks to the importance of kind of communication between mm -hmm. one part of the world and the other. <laughs> one virus is one plane flight away to yeah. coming somewhere else. We've always seen neonatal enterovirus sepsis cases. Mm -hmm. They tend to occur when a mom gets an illness late in the third trimester. The thinking is she gets infected, doesn't have time to create an antibody response to mm. to pass transplacentally to protect her baby. So the baby gets infected by virus after birth, doesn't have mom's antibody, and gets kind of overrun. And we can see hepatitis, encephalitis, myocarditis, mm -hmm. DIC, and, and the mortality rates are really high. Interestingly, during the pandemic, we didn't see circulation of a lot of our non-polio enterovirus, and we hardly saw any neonatal sepsis cases. So just like we were kind of holding on the edge of our seat for EV68, we've been watching when mm -hmm. is neonatal enterovirus sepsis going to return. And we started to hear reports first from our European colleagues in Italy mm -hmm. and France with this ECHO 11 outbreak in neonates causing fulminant hepatitis, liver failure, mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. high mortality rate. And it's been described to do that before, but right. definitely like clustering with a large number of cases in those areas. Um, so that had us on edge. And then uh, Catherine, Moore, Catherine Moore, who's a wonderful virologist in Wales, uh, also reported um, Coxsackie B myocarditis cases. Right. Again, severe presentation in neonates, mm -hmm. heart inflammation, high mortality rate. Um, and we really just weren't seeing it at the time, even when I was at ESCV. And I kind of mm -hmm. came back, sent some emails to some colleagues. Um, David Kimberlin, who's a big clinical researcher in PEDS ID, has a large multi-center uh, study out there to capture these cases mm -hmm. and collect samples and data. Um, and we just really started to see a trickle of cases in the U.S. So now we are seeing the kind of return to neonatal enterovirus sepsis cases. To me, they're looking a little bit more like the Coxsackie cases than the Echo yeah, 11 yeah. cases. Um, and we'll have to see what direction it's heading. I would say we're still at the kind of early uh, end of things, but there are there is a lot of chatter in the pediatric infectious disease community of who's seeing cases and what to do about them. And one of the major gaps in the field, and it's really more for these kids than the AFM kids, because uh, I would say the AFM kids are presenting late. We are, have trouble even finding virus there. So many would say that the virus has kind of done what it's going to do by the time they're clinically presenting. And the role for antivirals may be limited in an mm -hmm. AFM case. Neonatal sepsis babies are crawling with virus. So they, I mean, you can detect enterovirus in their CSF, in their blood, in their stool, wherever you test mm -hmm. at high, high mm -hmm. levels, low CT values. And we really, we have no FDA approved antienteroviral drugs. Um, as you know, placonaril is no longer available. And pocapavir, which is the only other drug that's out there, and this is a non-FDA uh, approved indication, is being made available by the company on compassionate use. But that's really the only drug we have out there to treat these kids with a, a virus that's kind of overrunning their system. So I was talking with Heli uh, and Eva and others at ESCV that we really need to ramp up our antienteroviral drug mm -hmm. options um, and find better ways to study them because all of the trials in the past have really struggled mm -hmm. to enroll kids enough to get good data to see if they're working or That's not. Hard so I think we the, need another approach. If the diseases are so rare, it's hard to do, right? And it has to be networked. And maybe it's not yeah. just in the U.S. too. It's U.S. Yeah. and Europe. And, and we really start to, to set up global trials because they're rare diseases, but they're horrible diseases. Mm -hmm. And they profoundly impact, if, if not uh, cause high mortality in, in infants that haven't even got the chance to start life. Well, you know, um, I don't, you probably know this study. People who are immunosuppressed and, and get OPV, they shed for a long time. So there was a patient in the UK who was treated for COVID with remdesivir, and that seems to have taken care of his 
chronic polio infection. Interesting. And so it may be that remdesivir would work against other enteroviruses, right? Interesting. So it's, it's worth looking at. Well, it's interesting too that I think kind of our only chance of getting enterovirus drugs happens to be drugs that are developed for those patients that yeah. you're talking about to try to eradicate carriage of, yes. of OPV and drugs like rupintravir and V4707, which are derived for that purpose can be repurposed if they have activity against other enteroviruses. So yeah, it's interesting how the worlds keep coming back to each other. It shouldn't, be, and... it shouldn't be a problem to develop a pan-enterovirus drug. It's just a matter of who can you get interested. And if there's a small commercial uh, market, then that's going to be hard. But you have CEPI and Ready, which are nonprofits that mm -hmm. could do this, and it would be worthwhile for them to get interested. Um, because, as you say, we we should have an antiviral because yeah. it's not too – when a child that presents with uh, neonatal sepsis, it's not too late to treat it, right? No, and I think that would be the real indication where you're in that phase of active viral replication yeah. that you need to shut down virus. Yep. Whereas the AFM cases, you may say, are, are further along and maybe you need immune modulation. Maybe monoclonal antibody in a mouse model can at least stop progression, but – I'm not so sure that timeline in humans is going to be fast enough to to. Yeah, I mean, in a mouse, everything is accelerated, yeah. right? So, and you can give virus and then give treatment yeah, right exactly away. Whereas right. a human, it takes. No, by the time you see a time. human, the virus is most likely very, very much gone, and mm -hmm. so a monoclonal wouldn't wouldn't be. Well, there are those great trials with gamma globulin and polio, where they yeah. would give it preemptively in a community that polio sure. was about to spread, and they could prevent it. But in those patients that had aseptic meningitis that hadn't yet progressed to paralytic disease, it didn't do anything. It was too late already. Yeah. So I think that's a signal that you would really need to use it early. So what is the global burden of enteroviruses? Give us some kind of sense. I know the data are hard. I think it's huge. And, and I think we could make a very strong case that they're underappreciated with as far as their burden of disease goes. Many of them are nearly ubiquitous. Almost all kids get... Mm -hmm hand, foot, mouth disease at some point. That's a clearly enterovirus-driven process. It's a big cause of neonatal fever, just kids who come in with fever in the first few weeks of life. And because of that, they have to get ruled out for bacterial sepsis. They get a spinal tap, they get blood cultures, they get urine cultures, they get two days of antibiotics until we can prove that it's, it's not that. That's a burden of disease in and of itself. It's severe in our humorally immune compromised patients, our transplant patients, those type of patients. Um, it's the most co common cause of aseptic meningitis in kids and adults. It's the most common cause of encephalitis in kids and probably adults. I think it's a huge player and it doesn't get the attention mm -hmm. of a lot of the other viruses. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. Is it just that we've come to accept that these are endemic viruses that we're gonna be living with forever? Because we don't have to. I mean, I would say that we know we can make them vaccine preventable. Granted, there would have to be more cross protection because there's so many different strains. Mm -hmm. We know we can create antivirals against them. I think there just has to be, some would say the appetite, others would say the market for it. But, yeah, of course. Um, yeah. You would hope that both. someone, if they could make a drug that would save a neonatal sepsis case, maybe even if there weren't a market, you could find a, a pathway, whether it's a charitable organization or other, to support it. Because it's horrible watching these cases and comforting these families from kids just getting overrun by a virus that you can't do anything about. Well, I think when something is at an endemic level and no one pays attention, it doesn't make headlines, then it's hard to get people interested. There's a, there's a commercial aspect, but I think you need advocacy. Yeah. You need people to say we need this and to really push it and that's not going to happen for enteros, at least now. Well, I, I mean, I think that did happen in a way with AFM, and I Man. credit the amazing parent community. Mm -hmm. So there were the parents from 2014, and many of them yep. got together on social media. They created Facebook groups. They actually created a 501c3 mm -hmm. um, to support other families going through it. And when they watched the outbreak in 2016 and then the outbreak in 2018, a big group of them went to Washington, D.C. and advocated with their representatives and their senators that more resources were put towards it. And I think that was part of the push behind mm -hmm. how we got the AFM Natural History Study, the 36 center, $10 million study to get better samples and data there. I, th I think you see Fauci write an editorial about AFM all of a sudden, and there was some push uh, behind it, kind of mm -hmm. climbing up the list of priorities at NIH. But I agree. I think sometimes you have to call out the endemic stuff too and say, yeah, it's been around forever, but why do we have to 
continue to see mm-hmm. morbidity and mortality due to it. Um, so there is a lot of exciting stuff happening in the field, which is really great. There's a lot of great basic science research uh, going on. There's a lot going on at NIH and CDC. So I don't want to be a, a pessimist. There's a lot of good good work happening in the area. But I think in order to get to a clinically applicable product, we need a, a commercial push somewhere to get it there. So in 2023, have there been uh, cases of AFM anywhere associated with D68? So 2023, not as far as I know. The last, mm-hmm. uh, the CDC kind of reported to our AFM working group that there were kind of baseline levels of AFM. We see AFM every year yeah. due to whatever cause um, and that we were not, uh, we had not detected EV68 from any of the cases uh, this year. Um I think it's something we need to keep doing surveillance on. We need to keep doing testing on. I would love to see uh, Ian Lipkin or Michael Wilson's uh, work with intrathecal antibody testing come to fruition because I do think there's a lot of cases that by the time they present, we can't even find it in the nasopharynx. Mm. But just like we do with West Nile looking for CSF IgM, we could detect antibodies there as a kind of footprint Mm. of the virus having been in the central nervous system. So I do think there's there's work to do to better investigate those cases. Um, but I'm just hoping the short attention span of the scientific funding world doesn't give up on AFM in terms of, uh, of directing resources away. Mm-hmm. We've had some quiet years. That's fantastic. I think every researcher's dream is that their disease goes away and they don't have to study it anymore. But I mean, just as with SARS-CoV-1 and everyone's funding ran out just in time for SARS-CoV-2 to come around, I think a long-term memory would serve us well in the kind of funding world as far as AFM and enteroviruses. So so when is the last AFM E68 outbreak? Is it 2018? 2018, yeah. So we saw 2014, 16, and 18, kind of those big AFM spikes. I would say the outbreak of respiratory disease in 2022 was as big, if not bigger, than 2014. But no AFM. But AFM at baseline level. So there was a decoupling for the very first time. And yeah. that is a huge area of interest of a lot of people of why did that happen all of a sudden? Well, I bet it's population immunity. I'll bet that's it. And if that's the case, you have to figure out what wow. aspect yeah. and how to maintain that, right? Yeah. Because if there's extensive cross-reactivity, it could be that some other... Um, Enterovirus was circulating that we're not aware of. You know, we're all full of them, right? Yeah. In our intestines, probably in our yeah. lungs too. They're benign. Yep. Uh, maybe they confer some immunity that we're not aware of. So, yeah, I agree. We do need to have more studies. And problem is, there's limited money and yeah. Yeah. a lot of infectious agents to give our attention to. Agreed. Speaking of uh, infectious agents, let's end with polio. <laughs> so, polio uh, eradication is. It's tough, as you know. You know we've eradicated supposedly a disease caused by serotypes uh, one, uh, two, and three, right? And we have one circulating still. What do you think? Can we? I'll ask you two separate questions. Can we eradicate poliomyelitis first? That's an easy one. So <laughs> no, and that goes back to the, the definition of poliomyelitis not being tied to polio virus. Okay, so let's say so, it's tied to polio. So polio virus, polio myelitis, yeah. I would say would be very, very difficult in the current state of affairs. We have mm. vaccine-derived polio. We have wild-type polio still out there. I think there's a lot of folks who think we're going to – we can control it. So we can okay. give IPB forever and prevent paralytic disease, which is the ultimate goal. I think my personal opinion is that's where we would end up, mm. is continually vaccinating against polio using IPB. So you would say globally we should all be using IPV? I don't think I have the credentials to uh, (laughs) make that decision. And I'm not a polio expert. I really do focus on the non-polio enteroviruses. I was raised in an era where fortunately I haven't had to see or treat polio. So you have much more expertise in this area than mine. I would worry very much if we stopped vaccinating against polio altogether yeah. that we would see Agreed. it recur. Oh, yeah. um, the OPV logistics of delivery versus IPV, the reversion issues with uh, live oral vaccines. Mm. I think anyone would tell you they would love to have uh, an oral inactivated vaccine that doesn't come with the risk of reversion yeah. And, yeah. and neurovirulence, but we, we don't have that. And I do worry that it's losing steam in terms of, of interest of, of developing better yeah. vaccines in that space. We have NOPV uh, too, but uh, as far as kind of other uh, OPV strategies. 
Well, if we're going to shut down the polio research uh, enterprise, we won't be able to make any new vaccines, and that's a problem. Right? Yeah, again, sh short-sightedness. I think we, we need to keep our eye on these constantly yeah. changing, changing viruses. How about can we eradicate polio virus? I think eradicating any virus that has any <laughs> reservoir is extraordinarily <laughs> challenging. Yeah, I think that uh, it would, part of the issue is we don't do enough environmental surveillance. That's my... Amy and my take on that, right? Because we worked together for many years. We've developed a lot of these ideas together. There's not enough environmental sampling. And if you don't look for something, how can you say it's not there anymore, right? Mm -hmm. for smallpox, we were lucky because every infection was rash. You could tell, right? And, yeah. But with polio, only one in a hundred or a few hundred are paralytic. So have you ever seen a case of polio virus induced nope. disease? That's nope. interesting. There, there aren't too many in the U.S. Yeah, I will say that one case that occurred in New one. York um, <laughs> yes. is a success story of the AFM surveillance system that the CDC has right. built. I think we've taken a lot of flack for a long time that we don't do AFP surveillance like many of the other you mm. know, WHO areas. But since 2014, we've been doing this more kind of focused AFM surveillance. Right. You need the MRI finding. But that case got reported as a case of AFM. The appropriate samples were collected, tested, and they... Um, detected polio virus. So I think mm -hmm. it shows that we've successfully set up a program that, that can detect clinical paralytic cases of polio virus, polio sure, myelitis. Sure. And then they looked in wastewater and they found virus extensively. And so it's circulating in, in the New York area as well. So uh, I, I'm curious where else it is because if we're using IPV in the U.S., then we're all susceptible to infection. And most likely there's there's polio and wastewater and other places, but they're not looking for it, so we'll never find it until there's a case of polio, right? All right, one, I have one more question. What would you have done if you hadn't been a, a physician scientist, let's say? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. I am loving coaching Little League right now. I've got a <laughs> six- and a nine-year-old, and I'm on the baseball field most afternoons. I love kids, so I'd probably be a teacher, a coach of some type. Uh, fortunately, I get to interact with kids on the kind of science and medicine mm. side of things, but I really love being around kids. They keep me young. They give me life. And I think if I wasn't on the medical side of pediatrics, I'd find some other way to All right. interact That's good. with kids. That's a good answer. All right. That's a special episode of TWIV. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, which is to teach you about science, we'd love your support. We are a nonprofit uh, corporation, and we do our work with your philanthropy. So please help us out, microbe.tv slash contribute. My guest today from University of Colorado, Kevin Messicar. Thank you so much for stopping Thanks by. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate <laughs> it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.